Hi, welcome back. In this session, the third of my data updates for 2017, I'd like to focus on a macro variable that we often don't pay enough attention to and that can get us into trouble. And that is how we deal with currencies in valuation. If you look at the basic intrinsic value equation, the discounted cash flow equation, here's what we see. The value of an asset is the present value of the expected cash flows on that asset, right? You've got the expected cash flows in the numerator and a risk-adjusted discount rate in the numerator. There is no mention of a currency in there. And for a long time, we never thought about currencies. In fact, if you were a U.S. analyst valuing companies in the last half of the 20th century, the only currency ever worked with was the U.S. dollar, and you never, never had to deal with other currencies. Increasingly, as we get global, we have to get more facile, more comfortable with dealing with currencies. We hate, and we need to do that, not just because we have to value companies in other markets, but because companies, even in our domestic markets, get a bulk of their revenue, a significant portion, from other countries and other currencies. Let me set the table. If you have to value a U.S. company that gets half of its revenues in the U.S., in U.S. dollars, and half of its revenues in Brazilian Riyadh, in Brazil, you have a choice. You can value the company entirely in U.S. dollars or you can value it in reais. Should you get the same answer? Will you? To see what happens when you introduce currency into valuation and to see how it plays out, let me go back to my intrinsic value equation. You have expected cash flows and you have a discount rate. Though there is no mention of a currency in there, there's a principle underlying how you have to estimate these cash flows and discount rates. And here's where currency makes its entry. Currencies are measurement mechanisms, and each currency comes with a different expected inflation component. So using the example that I just talked about, the U.S. dollar and the Brazilian Riyadh, at least at the start of 2017, the inflation rate in Brazilian Riyadh was significantly higher than the inflation rate in U.S. dollars. Let's say it was 6%, and that the U.S. dollar inflation rate was 2%. If you decide to do your valuation in Brazilian Riyadh, here's what you need to do. When you estimate the expected cash flows for your company, you will get an assist from that 6% inflation rate. doesn't mean that your company will have to grow at 6%, but that 6% inflation rate will augment whatever real growth your company has. And then when you do your discount rate, that same 6% will make an entry into your discount rate as an additional component. If I switch to US dollars, both the numerator and the denominator should reflect a 2% inflation rate. That brings me to two very basic propositions. I would like to put on the table about currencies. Currencies matter in valuation, but they matter everywhere. Not just in your discount rate, not just in your cash flows, but in, in your cash flows, your growth rates, and your discount rates. So the first principle is once you pick a currency, all your inputs will change to reflect that currency. The second is a more powerful principle. If you value a company right, it should be currency invariant. What does that mean? The company that I just talked about that I value in US dollars and Brazilian reais should have the same value whether I value it in one currency or the other. After all, a company should not become good or bad just because I switch currencies in evaluation. That would, like, that would be the equivalent of me telling you that the temperature in Mumbai is 100 degrees Fahrenheit, but then when I switch to Celsius, it's now become cooler. It hasn't. I've just restated the temperature in a different measurement, with a different measurement gauge. So with that set up, let's think about the two basic numbers that are going to drive how currencies show up in your valuation. The first is exchange rates. When you're working with two currencies, the real and the dollar, the peso and the euro, and you have to convert one currency to another, it's a challenge you face not just today, but one year out, two years out, three years out, because you made forecasts for the future. You need to forecast exchange rates. I'll tell you the one number you cannot use. You cannot just use today's exchange rate as your exchange rate for the future. So one of the questions we have to address is, how do you come up with expected exchange rates? And that expected exchange rate has to give you currency invariance. The second is discount rates. How do we estimate discount rates as we move from currency to currency? Here again, there are measurement questions you have to answer. Do I have to adjust the risk-free rate? How about the risk premiums? What if I have a beta? Should I be using different betas depending on what currency I do evaluation? So let me start with that exchange rate question. We're all taught to estimate exchange rates very early in an econ class. In fact, one of those very fundamental equations we're all taught is called purchasing power parity. In purchasing power parity, 
the expected exchange rate in the future. So if you have a local currency and a foreign currency, the way that exchange rate is going to vary over time is going to depend on the expected inflation rates in the two currencies. Put simply, if you take the US dollar in the Brazilian Riyadh example that I just stated, you have a 6% inflation rate in Riyadh and a 2% inflation rate in the US dollar. With purchasing power parity, the Riyadh is going to depreciate roughly 4% a year for as long as those inflation rates are expected to prevail. You're saying, so unrealistic, right? You're saying currencies don't move according to inflation. You're right. In short periods or even over extended periods, we know that currencies often, often deviate from purchasing power parity. But you know what? When you do valuation, you might still want to stick with purchasing power parity when you do the valuation because it is the only way of estimating exchange rates that will in fact give you currency invariance. A, a close variant is interest rate parity. In other words, when you use forward rates, which are driven by interest rate parity, you are in fact using a close relative of purchasing power parity. And if you do so, let that in interest rate differential also be your inflation differential. You see, what if I have a strong view on exchange rates? What if I think the Indian rupee is going to strengthen over the next 10 years, even though inflation in the Indian rupee is much higher than in the US dollar? Should I bring it into my valuation? My advice to you is that you don't. That sounds like a strange thing to do, but here's why. Let's assume that you expect the Indian rupee to strengthen substantially and that you bring that view of viewpoint into your estimates of cash flows for an Indian company. You know what's going to happen, right? You're going to increase the cash flows. You're going to push up the value of the company. You're going to tell me the company's undervalued. So far, so good. But then when I ask you how much of this valuation is due to what you think about the company and how much is due to what you think about ex exchange rates, my guess is you can't separate the two. I'd prefer when you do company valuations that you leave your exchange rate views outside the door. You're welcome to tell me what they are afterwards because that might drive my asset allocation decision determines how much money I invest in Indian stocks. But generally speaking, it is best to do valuation, falling back on that old refrain of purchasing power parity. Now let's talk about discount rates. There are two ways in which you can think about estimating discount rates in a foreign currency, a currency that you're not comfortable with. The first is you can do it from the ground up. What do I mean by that? You can start with a risk-free rate in that currency and build up using the same mechanisms you might have used in whatever currency you used to do the valuation. So I'll make it specific. When I estimate a cost of equity in US dollars, I start with a risk-free rate, I estimate a beta, and I come up with an equity risk premium. I pull them together to get a cost of equity in US dollars. If I got a risk-free rate in nominal reais or in nominal rupees, perhaps I could do the same thing. Start with that risk-free rate, then do the beta times risk premium to come up with the cost of equity. That's from the ground up. We'll talk about the pluses and minuses of that, but there is an alternative approach. In the alternative approach, rather than start with the ground up with a risk-free rate in the local currency and build up, I estimate my cost of capital in whatever currency I'm comfortable in. I'm most comfortable in the US dollar because I work with it more than any other currency. But let's say I come up with the cost of capital in US dollars. I'm going to argue that if inflation is the key rationale or the reason for differences across currencies, adding a differential inflation to that cost of capital in US dollars will give me a cost of capital in a foreign currency. I'm going to argue that this may actually be a more consistent way of estimating cost of equity and capital in foreign currencies. So let's start with risk-free rates. There are four different ways in which I'm going to lay out estimating risk-free rates with some actual numbers from the start of 2017. Here's the simplest and the one that seems to come most directly from the way we're all taught corporate finance and valuation. When I was taught corporate finance, I was told to use a government bond rate as my risk free rate. Of course, these were the days when everything was US centric and we talked all about the US T bond rate. But that lesson has been extended out into other currencies and you're often told use the government bond rate as your risk free rate. Now, not all governments have bonds outstanding and not all government bonds are traded. But if you can find a government bond that's traded and interest rate in the bond, maybe you're home free. If you look at this graph, you will actually see government bond rates across currencies. And you can see already that those rates vary from less than zero with the Swiss franc to more than 15% with the Nigerian Naira. You're saying, what's wrong with this? This is my risk-free rate. Remember though, when you use a government bond rate as a risk-free rate, first you're telling me you trust that rate. You're saying, what do you mean? I trust the government bond rate. It's a market set rate, is it? I know the UST bond rate is a market set rate. I know the German bond rate, uh, the, the German 10-year bond rate is a market set rate. 
Do I know whether the Indian government bond rate is a market set rate? Perhaps. Is the Nigerian Naira bond a market set rate? The reason I bring this up is there are lots of government bonds where there is no liquid market and the rate you observe is not a market set rate. I'll give you an extreme example. The Venezuelan 10-year government bond rate was about 14%. Do you really think that the risk-free rate in Venezuelan Bolivar is 14% now? This is a country with inflation in the thousands of percent. But the government set the rate and my guess is nobody trades that rate. That rate. So the first problem with using government bond rates is they might not actually be market set rates. Here's the second one. When you use a government bond rate, implicitly are assuming that governments are default free. You say, what's wrong with that? If it's a local currency bond, you can always print more currency. Technically, that's true. But that, do you know that in the last 50 years, there have been at least a half a dozen, perhaps more, local currency, local currency, government bond defaults. And here's why it happens. Governments, when faced with a problem, can either print more currency or default. Why won't they want to print more currency? If you print more currency, you have extraordinary inflation. So faced with a choice between default and debasing your currency, there are governments that choose to default. What I'm effectively saying is this rate might not be risk-free because there might be some default risk in it. And that brings me to the second way in which I can think about risk-free rates. I can start with the government bond rate and back out of it a portion that I think is due to default risk. I do this at the start of every year with cross fingers and here's what I do. I find the local currency sovereign ratings on Moody's. In theory, this should be based on default risk that Moody's sees in your country when it borrows in the local currency. I have a default spread that goes with each sovereign rating. I take that default spread and net it out of the government bond rate to come up with the risk-free rate. You see, why net it out? Because that government bond rate includes default risk and I'm taking out the portion that I think is due to default risk. So as an example, let's say your government bond rate is 15%, but based on your local sovereign rating, I think your default spread is 4%. 15 minus 4 gives me a risk-free rate of 11%. So second approach, still built on government bonds, has all the con problems of, of government bonds not being trustworthy. And now you've added an additional layer of trusting ratings agents to get the rating right and trusting the default spread as a good measure of the rating. Getting into deeper and deeper ground, right? So let's go to the third way to think about risk-free rates. In this, you start with the risk-free rate you trust. For instance, I might say, look, you know, the T-bond rate for all of its flaws is a market set rate. I trust that 2.45% as a risk-free rate in US dollars. Then you look up two numbers. Remember the Brazil example, 6% inflation in Brazil, 2% inflation in India, I'm sorry, 2% inflation in, in the US. You take that difference of 4%, add it on to the risk-free rate of 2.45%, you've come up with a risk-free rate in the real. In fact, that's an approximation. The right thing to do actually is compounding, and when you compound, you're going to come up with a rate slightly higher, 6.6 or 6.7% is a risk-free rate. But effectively, what you're doing is, is starting with a risk-free rate in a currency you trust, and adding differential inflation. The advantage of this approach is you're no longer dependent on those government bonds and currencies where there might be no liquidity or trading in that bond. Now, but there is a cost you pay when you use this approach. When you use this approach, you're effectively assuming that the real interest rate, remember that component of the risk-free rate that's going to, that's real interest rate, is the real interest rate embedded in the US dollar, which right now is about a half a percent. So you're effectively assuming that there's only one real risk-free rate around the globe. A defensible, defensible assumption if you think capital flows freely across markets and you're using that as your real risk-free rate globally. You say, what if I don't buy into that? I'm going to give you my fourth way of estimating risk-free rates. I'm going to go back to the old Fisher equation, the equation we're all taught when we first taught risk-free rates. In the Fisher equation, the risk-free rate is expected real interest rate plus an expected inflation. In the long term, and this is an assumption that requires a few jumping through hoops, you could assume that the expected real interest rate is equal to the expected real growth in an economy. Do you see where I'm going to go next? If I buy into that presumption, then the risk-free rate in a country should be the sum of two things, the real growth rate for that country plus the expected inflation rate for that country. It effectively also means that the overvaluations valuations will now become currency-specific because if I value a company then in U.S. dollars and build in a half a percent real risk free rate and I revalue it in Brazilian Riai where I might have built in a two and a half percent real risk free rate, 
I'm going to end up with a higher value in US dollars than in the local currency. That's something you have to wrestle with and be okay with if you use this approach. Which brings me to the, the last piece of this puzzle, which is maybe we shouldn't be going through the risk-free rate in the first place. Because of all of the steps you get. And here's why. If I estimate a risk-free rate in local currency, let's say in Nigeria and Nara, to be about 11%, and then I get my risk premiums. And remember, most risk premiums I get from dollar-based markets. And let's say that risk premium is 5.69% in, in a US dollar market. I'm applying that same 5.69% premium to both a 2.45% risk-free rate and 11% risk-free rate. That strikes me as unreasonable. It's one thing to demand a 5.69% risk premium when your risk-free rate is 2.5%. It seems to me that you would demand a larger premium if your risk-free rate were 10 or 11%. So here's the fix for that. Do your entire cost of equity and capital in US dollars or euros or whatever currency you feel comfortable in. After you're done, estimate the inflation rate in the foreign currency and the local currency. So for that Brazilian company, the company for which I wanted to estimate a cost of capital in Brazilian terms, I'm going to do the entire cost of capital in US dollar terms, and then I'm going to add the extra 4%, or if I want to be precise, compound it at that extra 4% to come up with the cost of capital in the local currency. So let's sum up. When you sit down to value a company, now you have choices. You value a company like Nestle, you can value it in euros, you can value it in Swiss francs, you can value it in US dollars. You value a company like Infosys, you can value it in rupees, you can value it in dollars, or you can value it in any currency you want. Currency is a choice. Once you made that choice, remember, the inflation you're embedding in your numerator and your denominator should be, key, should be the same. That's key. And that takes a huge load off your shoulders because especially in emerging markets, you're going to say, well, what if I don't know what the inflation rate is going to be? What if I'm hopelessly wrong? It's okay. Because if you're hopelessly wrong in exactly the same way, both your cash flows and your discount rates, it's going to cancel out. What gets us into trouble in valuations is different expectations of inflation coming from your cash flows and your discount rates. And there are lots of ways those inconsistencies pop up. But that's for a different post. Thank you very much for listening.